It's your open source advocate and I'm back and I want to cover a topic that I covered quite a while ago now and it's really a useful tool and it's really a great tool and, and it's open source. Now, as with any open source project, Portainer, which is a GUI built for the web that lets you install, set up, manage, keep updated, you know, anything and everything to do with Docker, basically. It's really, really great. So if you've, if you've watched my videos and you see me do things with Docker on the command line, we'll do a little bit of that today to get Pertainer installed. But once you've got Pertainer installed, you've got access to their templates. You can add on third-party templates. You can do all kinds of things that already have a lot of that set up. And really, you just have to understand a little bit about it to go in and set up the specifics for your environment. And then you can run those containers inside of Portainer and you can actually manage everything with Portainer from a GUI front end, which is great. And, and believe me when I tell you, I'm, I'm a CLI kind of person. I love the CLI and I love tools that you can get on the command line. But if they give me a really great GUI, then, then I'm really happy about that. And Portainer for me has been a terrific graphical user in, interface and, and just a really great experience overall. And the Portainer Community Edition is open source. It's free to use. Now, they have straight Pertainer, that if you prefer to use Pertainer, the full thing, there, there's a cost to that, but that's, again, how they support keeping the Community Edition running. So anytime you have an open source project that's going to go for a long time, you have to understand that they have to support that somehow monetarily, or else it's all volunteer all the time. And it's great to have people who want to volunteer and who are passionate enough to volunteer all of their time and all of their effort always, but the real world has bills and the real world has rent and the real world has mortgages and the real world has car payments and the real world has groceries and food and, and just so much more that costs money. Um, unfortunately, you know, while volunteer work looks great on a resume, it does not pay your bills or get your rent done unless you get the job you're applying for. So a lot of these uh, community additions will will be fully open source, but they they do come at a cost of if you want support, if you want extra features, if you want something faster than it comes out in the community edition, then basically you have to pay for the extras, right? Um, and, and I don't call that crippleware. There is definitely crippleware out there, um, which means like there's great features, but you can't get them unless you pay. And and really, I call it crippleware whenever. Um, and, and, you know, please don't, don't write me about using the word cripple. Um, but I call it crippleware because... They actually strip it down so much that it's not a useful product unless you pay for it. These things that I'm showing you that are open source are, are very, very much very useful products, even if you don't pay for the full license or, or the full service or whatever they have to offer. I'm just letting you know that all of these projects that I show or almost all of the projects that I show you have some method of monetizing their projects and the good thing about that is it keeps that project going. Everybody loves free software. Everybody loves something for free, but really nothing is free. Everything costs at some point. So understand that it's going to cost you a little bit of money somewhere, right? You have to buy the hardware. You have to have the hardware. Somehow you got a hold of the hardware to run this stuff on, or you're going to use a VPS, or you're going to use something else, right? So, so just you know, go into this with an open mind about, I understand that this is free and open source, and I can use it that way. But I also understand that they do have ways of monetizing what they're doing so that they can pay salaries or they can pay their developers a little bit of money. Or sometimes they pay the volunteers a little bit or give them a little gift card once in a while for, you know, to say thank you. It just depends on the project. And most of them have very transparent methods of seeing what they spend their money on. So, so get out there and look around if you're curious about that. I want to say thank you to all of my patrons over at Patreon and my subscribers on YouTube. Thank you so much for all of your support. I love doing this channel. I love making this media and this content for you. I hope you enjoy it as well. I do post all of the videos now over at Patreon after one of my patrons made the suggestion, and I don't know why it didn't dawn on me before that. But if you're interested in seeing them through Patreon and getting a notification through Patreon instead of through YouTube or hoping that YouTube's algorithms happens to show it to you, jump over and become a supporter on Patreon, patreon.com. I've got the links in the description and the show notes. I appreciate your support. Thank you so much. Today, what I want to talk about is how to install Portainer CE, which is the community edition, the fully free and open source version, and really what you can do with it. And then we're also going to talk about Portainer Agent because I want to, I want to show you that here where I've got, I've got my local Portainer. So this is the actual machine and it's running Portainer CE. 
But right here I'm using Pertainer Agent and I'm connecting it to this machine so that I can manage multiple machines with Docker and all the stuff that's installed with them from a single GUI. I don't have to go to different, different URLs to do this. And then I've got this third one where I removed it so we'll add it back to this machine and then we'll get this machine set back up so that we can access it again. Um, but first I just want to install full out pertainer with you guys so that you can see what it is and how it works and, and then we'll then we'll do the agent so you can see how that functions. So I'm going to go to DigitalOcean and, and I love DigitalOcean. I know a lot of people ask me, well, why do you use DigitalOcean? How come not Linode? How come not some other one? I've been with DigitalOcean for a long time. I really like what they do. I like the VPS offerings that they have. They're trying to branch out. They're trying to give better offerings. They're trying to compete a little bit. You know, they're not at the AWS level, but they're trying to offer things like AWS offers. And you constantly see more things showing up in this sidebar. When I first got with them, droplets were it. You, you, this is what they call their little virtual machines that you can get. That was all they had, and, and now they've got all these different things you can do. You can do object storage. You can do so much stuff with DigitalOcean. I, I, I really like what they have. So, full transparency, I am I am not sponsored by DigitalOcean, but I do have a link in my show notes and descriptions most of the time that is a DigitalOcean link. So, if you go sign up, you get a credit with DigitalOcean for the first couple of months that you're with them. It also gives me a credit when you sign up. So I want you to understand, if you go sign up with DigitalOcean with my link, I do get a credit, but you also get a credit. So we both kind of win. DigitalOcean wins because they might get a new customer, which is great. But I really do like their stuff. It's really great. Now, I also use SSD nodes. So I use DigitalOcean kind of for my testing stuff. And then I use SSD nodes for more like I'm going to use this for production stuff that I'm going to keep up and running for a long time. Just because there's a cost and price difference. There's also a performance difference. So you need to understand that. SSD nodes does not run the same types of virtual machines as uh, DigitalOcean. The DigitalOcean machines tend to be much faster and, and be able to handle much more on a much smaller server. Uh, but that said, SSD nodes can handle a lot on the servers that they offer, and the servers that they offer are far less expensive um, overall for a year. So so just understand, there's differences between those, but I have affiliate links on for both of them. Um, I'm not trying to push you one way or the other. If you like Linode, go use Linode. Linode is probably very good. I've never used it, but I've heard it's really, really great. So feel free to pick the VPS you want. I'm just going to use this to demo how to set up Portainer today. So I'm going to go in here and just create a droplet. This is what they call their virtual machine or their virtual servers. And I'm going to use Ubuntu. Now you can pick what you like here. As long as you understand how to run Docker on any of these things, feel free to pick whatever you want. I'm going to set up a Ubuntu 2004. And I'm just going to go down and you see this little dot right here and it says new and then there's this other one that says new. You can kind of pick from these different things and you'll see the prices don't change between these two. But if you pick this one over here, you'll get a very basic server, which is all I need today. And you can do a $5, $10, $15, $20, whatever. I'm just going to do a $5 server. That's all I need. I'm not even going to leave it up for a month so it won't cost me even 5 bucks actually. But then I can pick a, a location, and I want to pick a location that's geographically close to me. I'm actually almost dead between New York and San Francisco, so whichever one I pick doesn't really matter um, latency-wise. Uh, but if, if you're in another part of the world, try to find one of these places that's a little bit more geographically close to you, and you'll have just less latency. Now, if you're trying to set this up to use as a VPN server on DigitalOcean, then, of course, pick a place where you want <laughs> to be able to get service through that VPN, right? If you're trying to stream movies from the U.S., you want to have a VPN set up in the U.S. Um, same way for other countries of the world. So keep that in mind. As we move down, I'm not going to do a VPC network, but you do have that option if you want to. So a virtual private network between your local machine and this thing is, is totally available. Um, I do have SSH, SSH keys set up, but if you want a password, you just click here and then put in a password. Make sure you get little check marks on all of the rules and then hit go and you'll just use a password to log in instead of an SSH key. Um, in my case, I've got SSH keys and I just need this one here. Uh, don't worry about that thing that flashes up. That's just my public key. So even if you took it, you couldn't really do anything with it. Don't sweat it. Um, so the droplets, I just need one droplet, which is fine. You can make multiple droplets if you want to. And you can give this thing a name, and I'm going to call this test for portainer. And this is what's going to give us the host name. So if you need something to have an actual, you know, fully qualified domain name as the host name, keep that in mind. But that's what it's going to get for the host name. We're just going to use the IP today. I'm going to hit create. It's going to go out there and start creating this thing. And it only takes, you know, 15, 20 seconds, maybe 30 seconds to create these containers uh, or these virtual machines. So it, it's actually really fast to get it set up. It's all SSDs that they run. Um, you know, everything like that. It's virtualized memory and virtualized hard drive space, really. So it runs very quickly. 
And there it is, it's done. My Ubuntu server is pretty much set up. I'm just gonna copy this IP address right here. And I'm gonna go open up my terminal. I'm just gonna do SSH root at the IP address that I copied and to paste that in, I'm gonna do control shift and V like Victor. And that's gonna paste in that IP address in the terminal. I'm gonna go ahead and hit enter. It's gonna ask me, do I wanna trust that fingerprint? And I do. And then it's gonna use my SSH keys to verify me and log me in. So I'm gonna clear that so you can see it and you see that it gave it the name that I told it to, which is test hyphen portainer. That's the host name of this thing. If you wanna prove it to yourself, just type in host name and hit enter and it'll show you the host name as well. So we wanna run portainer agent on this one first, just to kind of get it set up. It's actually really quite simple, but in order to do it, we need Docker installed. So if I do Docker dash dash V, you'll see I don't have Docker installed. It doesn't know what that is. Now it's gonna tell you, you can install Docker with snap or with apt, the problem is that it installs docker.io and we don't want docker.io because all of the things that I do, I use the docker-ce community edition um, and it, it's a little different usually than the docker.io stuff. So we're going to we're gonna do something a little different to get this. So I'm going to say clear. I'm going to do nano and I'm going to create an install script. Install docker.sh and we're just going to open that up in my browser and I'll have this link in the show notes. I'm going to go open up a new tab and I'm going to go to github.com slash bmcgonag. It's Docker installs. So I'll put this link in the description. Don't worry. But you'll see here I've got a few different uh, scripts here to help me install this. And I've got one for 2004. So I'm just going to click into it. I'm going to scroll up just a little bit and then down just a little. I'm going to start right here at line one. I'm going to highlight and copy all the way down to the end right there. And I'm going to copy that. I'm going to go back to my terminal and I'm going to use control shift V again to paste, make sure there's a line right here at the end. And then I'm just going to scroll up real quick, make sure I got everything, didn't get any extra stuff, any weird stuff. We're just going to make sure everything looks good and it does. I'm going to do control O to save. I'm going to do control X to exit. So now if I do cat install docker.sh, you'll see I have that whole script there. So this script just goes out and says, let me get all of the stuff I need for Docker for Ubuntu 2004. So I'm gonna do chmod. This means change my permissions, modify my permissions. And I'm gonna do plus X and then docker or install. Yeah, install docker.sh. So this says change the permissions on this file and make it executable. So we've done that. If we do ls-al, you can see right here, here's my install docker.sh. And you see it's got a little X. X here for the for the everybody, X here for the group, and X here for the user root, which is logged in right now, and root is the owner of this file because I'm logged in as root. Now normally you wouldn't do this as root, you would create a new user and, and go through that process, but for now we're just we're just trying to show how to do this. So I want to install Docker and Docker Compose, so that's what this is gonna do. I'm gonna clear this out. I'm gonna do dot slash install docker.sh. So I'm just going to let it run this command and it's going to go out. It's going to update the packages for Ubuntu. So it installed our, re our prerequisite packages basically for Docker. Now it's going to go through and it's going to look for the signing keys for Docker. And then it's going to add the Docker repository. When it does that, it does a quick update again for apt. And then it goes out and it says, okay, I need to get this stuff. And it's going to start installing Docker itself. So now it's installing Docker CE. Now it's going to install Docker compose. and everything is done. Now one of the other things that it did, and it kind of goes past really fast, is it also, if you're not logged in as root, it tries to add the currently logged in user to the Docker group. So basically that says, you know, if I was logged in as Brian at this thing, it would add my user Brian to the Docker group and it says, from then on, I don't have to do sudo docker every single time. I don't have to use the sudo command. I can just do docker whatever I want to do. So if I do docker ps, you see I get the command line. If I do docker, and I'll clear this to make it at the top of the screen for you guys, docker dash dash v. Now you see I get a bunch of information about docker. And I think, oh, dash v, whoops. So if I just do clear docker dash v, we can see the version of Docker that I've got, which is 20.10.7, and here's the build number. So you can see the Docker's now installed and ready to go. So that's awesome. Now we want to install Portainer since Docker's installed. 
And we want Portainer to be our, our kind of GUI front end for Docker to do all the things that we could do with the command line. So we're going to open up our browser again. We're going to go back to the Portainer website, the Portainer CE website. And it says, here's the Computing Edition. You can watch some videos about it, everything like that. And here we've got the install Portainer CE. So we're going to click on that link. It's going to open up and it's going to tell us here's how you do it. So if you want to do it in Docker, you can do it this way. If you want to do it with Docker Swarm, you've got that option. And if you want to do it in Kubernetes, you've got that option. We're just going to do Docker today. Don't have to get all fancy. So the first thing it wants us to do is create a Docker volume. So we're just going to highlight this, make sure we get all of the letters in that, in that line. We're going to copy it. And we're going to go over here and paste. And this will be in the show notes as well. So I'm going to paste this in. It creates a volume real quick creates a Docker volume and then we're going to grab this second line right there and there's a little copy down here at the end if you just want to click that and copy it you can um, we're going to go back to our container all right we're going to close that we're going to just do control shift V again to paste in that command it's going to run right away it didn't even let me yeah okay all right, it looks like it ran. That's good. So let's just go through it just so we can we can see what it did. So it, it sets up two port forwards, 8,000 and 9,000. So if you don't want this to run right away because you need to change a port, with Docker, the left side port is your host, your host machine. So this is kind of like if you're working on your desktop, this would be your desktop ports right here. And it maps those ports or it forwards those ports to your container port on the right side of that colon. So you don't want to change this side unless you really know what you're doing or you're a developer for that project. But on this side, you can change that port on the left to anything that's open on your machine. And if you don't have 9,000 or 8,000 open, you want to change that to something else and just know what you changed it to. Then it gives it the name Portainer. It says we're going to restart always. So if you restart the machine, it's going to it's going to it's going to restart on its own. If you if you restart, if you if it crashes, it's going to try to restart on its own. There's just lots of things in, in play there that'll make it restart. Um, it's going to get access to var run docker .soc, which it needs in order to kind of do its thing to manage your Docker containers. So it creates the container portainer data on the host and it points to slash data on the container side. So again, here we created this folder right here, this, this, this directory, and it's going to point to that from the host to that on the container slash data. And then here, this tells it what image to pull, which is Portainer and Portainer Community Edition. And then it runs it. So it tells us that it pulled it down. Everything's going. We can do Docker PS if we just want to see, is it running? And it is. And you can see right here, it's been up about a minute. So now we can go back to our uh, Firefox here. I'm going to jump into DigitalOcean real quick. I'm going to grab that IP address again. I just want to have that IP. And we're going to go here and we're going to open up a new tab. We're going to paste in that IP address and then we're going to put colon 9000. Now you can do this on your local network, you can do this on a VPS, you can do this wherever you want, but the first time you run it, I'm going to make this a little bit larger for you guys that might be on your phones. Now on the first time you run it, it wants you to put in a username. So username admin's fine if that's what you want, but I usually use like a, a, a username like that or Brian at fixitdelrio.com, something like that. And then a password that's a strong password is always good. Make sure you type it in twice correctly. It'll give you a little check mark if it's happy with it. And it tells you it must be at least eight characters long. And it says, allow collection of anonymous statistics. If you want to do that, feel free to keep it checked. Um, otherwise, you can say create user. And then it says, restore pertainer from a backup. So you have that option as well if you don't want to, to do this part. So we're going to say create user. And you see we get logged in here. I'm going to go to don't save right now. So right here it asks you, hey, how are, you know, what are you trying to control with this install of Portainer? Let me get rid of this line. And it's, it gives you some options. You can say just Docker, Kubernetes, or the agent. So I want to use Docker. So I'm going to click on Docker. It's going to say, okay, sounds good. Manage the Docker environment where Portainer is running. And it just says, make sure you started the pertainer container with these flags, which we did. So we're going to say connect. And here we are. We're at it. Okay. So we get this thing called local. I'm going to, I'm going to zoom this back out just a little bit. So it'll look a little more normal. And 
you get this little warning up here, this kind of message, and sometimes these pop up when there's updates. They pop up for all kinds of reasons. And so it tells you Portainer CE 2.6.0 is available. So there's, uh, it's just letting us know, even though we're on that version, it's just kind of a, a flag that automatically jumps up until you dismiss it. It shouldn't come up again now until there's a new message to have. Uh, but here we see local. So this is the only thing we've got set up, but we can go into local. And right off the bat, you get this little dashboard that shows you how many stacks. So this is kind of like your Docker Compose stacks. How many images. How many networks there are for Docker. How many containers there are for Docker. And how many volumes you have for Docker. So you can manage all of these things through this user interface. Everything on the left side as well. So we're going to go into containers. And you can see Portainer is running. And we can look at the logs right here. So if we click, we can see the logs. And you'll notice it's got these little switches, so it has auto refresh on. So if you're ever trying to read the log and you're having to scroll down and it keeps jumping, it's because auto refresh is on. You can come up here and turn this off and it'll quit trying to refresh on its own. And then you can scroll around if you need to, to check out what's happening in the logs to try to troubleshoot. Um, it'll say wrap lines. If you don't want it to wrap the lines, it won't. But if you do, if you leave that on, then it'll wrap the lines just because it makes it easier to read without scrolling sideways. Um, display timestamps, you can turn that on or off as well. And then fetch all logs, you can limit this, you can limit how many lines it gets, or you can extend how many lines it gets, all kinds of things. You can download the logs, you can copy the logs, you can just do a lot here with the logs, which is really great. It, it's easy to do it in the command line, it's just docker logs and then the name of the, of the uh, actual container. But all these other options, like this automatic, uh, automatic refresh, it's really nice because in the command line, it's going to give you what's there when you run the command. But if you want to see more, you got to rerun the command to get it to give you more information. So this really helps. If we go back to the container, it's got some really great stuff here. So it's got inspect. So you can see what's inside the container, what's going on with it. So if you click that, you can kind of see what's happening here. And there's expandable sections. So you can get a lot of information here. Now, the other nice thing about it is you can just click on the container itself. And you can see, here's all of these controls across the top. So you can say stop. You can kill the container. You can reboot the container. You can pause the container, resume the container if you've paused it. You can remove it completely. So be careful with that button. You can recreate it. So what this means is, like, stop it. Kind of re-pull the stuff and, and, you know, recreate the container completely. Like, stop it, get rid of the container that's there, and recreate the container and bring it back up. So if there's a problem, sometimes just doing that fixes it. But you need to understand, if you have not persisted data in volume mapping, then that'll be gone. But you can do that. But the other nice thing is when you click Recreate, if there's an update available for one of these things, um, for, the, for like a newer image, you can just click on Recreate, tick this button, and then hit it. And it's going to go and pull the latest image down and recreate that container with all of your settings that were already there but it's going to use the latest image to create the new container. So this is actually how I update most of my containers these days uh, through Portainer is I just tick that box and let it do it for me. Um, so it's pretty great. Instead of having to go back in and find the command that I ran and all the stuff, this makes it really, really simple. I'm going to cancel out of that for now. Then there's duplicate and, uh, yeah, duplicate and edit. So you have this duplicate and edit. So if you want to duplicate this container for some reason, you can click on this button and it's going to open up the editing screen. You can give it a different name so there's not a collision there. And you can run two of the same type of container with different names and, and do things. If you're going to do testing on one and have one as production, that kind of stuff, it's really useful. The edit part is I want to edit this thing and I just need to make some changes in, you know, in the configuration. And you have access to all of the configuration all the way down whenever you do edit mode, um, which makes it really easy to do things inside of Portainer. You just have to understand what each thing is and what's required. But after you do this a little while, it, it actually gets easier and easier. So that's your container part. Here you've got the images. So this will list all of the images that you've pulled down and it'll tell you whether they're in use or not in use. And if you see a bunch that are not in use, you can usually get rid of them because you're, you probably tested something and then decided not to use it. For your Docker networks, you can really set up a lot of stuff with Docker networks, which is great. You'll see your volumes listed in Portainer, so you can check out what volumes you have set up, what volumes are being used, how much space they're taking, things like that. So you can manage your volumes here as well. So you can check out events that are happening on your Docker system inside of Portainer. 
you can kind of keep an eye on your host and see what's going on with your host as well. A little bit of host information there. Then you've got host setup. So enable host management features. If you have host management features, you can enable that as well. Um, enable volume management for non-administrators. So there's a lot of stuff here that you can do with the pertainer setup as far as like multi-user as well. You can disable bind mounts for non-administrators, disable privilege mode for non-administrators. I mean, just so many things here that you can go through and kind of check out as far as settings go. And then you actually do have settings here as well. So you have snapshots that you can take, which is awesome. That's really a great way to kind of keep things backed up. You can use custom logos for your snapshots. And then you've got URLs for the app templates. So this is their app template. As far as I know, this is the, the main app template that they use. But if you don't want to use their app template, you can replace this with a different uh, URL to use a, another group's templates or app templates. Um, if you look at the app templates, this is really just Docker containers that you can go and get and set up using Portainer. And they have these templates pre-created for you to go out and set up and kind of get running. Now, you still need to understand a little bit about what is required for these templates and how they work, but you can basically go set these things up really quickly with a few clicks. Um, so UR Backup is one that I'm interested in and I'll probably be setting up soon, but it's a nice backup server um, that you can set up with clients on the Windows side that kind of auto-find the server. I just need to set up a Windows machine I want to use with it. Uh, you can also do it with Linux, but it's CLI stuff on the client side, which is a bit of a bummer. Unless they've updated, I need to check it out. Uh, but there's quite a bit, quite a few things here that you can do um, as far as what you have with the templates that they create. So this is their their main templates, which is pretty cool. So now I've shown you the basics of getting Portainer installed, set up, and ready to go. This is this is kind of starting spot, right? But I want to go here, and I'm going to take. I'm just going to close this because we're going to go back. We're going to go to my portainer setup here somewhere. There we go. And you see here, I've got my local and then I've got my remote one that's running the portainer agent. So I want to show you how to set up the portainer agent because this machine, I took it off of it a few days ago or a week, a couple weeks ago, and I want to put it back on. So I want to set up the portainer agent. So I'm going to go back into the, the to the browser here, and again, I'll have this link in the in the show notes and description. But right below where we got our portainer command is the portainer agent command. So I'm just going to click copy. I'm going to go back into my terminal, and I'm going to do Control Shift and V to paste that in, and it's going to run right away again. But it's this time it's getting the portainer agent. You can see that right there. So I've gone through and removed that endpoint where we just installed the Portainer agent. <clears throat> We're going to go back through the process of adding it back. So whenever you log into Portainer, this is kind of the view that you'll see when you start adding Portainer agents to it, because that way you can you can pick which one you want to go into. So we're going to go down. We're going to go to the endpoint section here and we're going to click on add an endpoint. In this case, it's agent, but you can have you can have edge agent. You can have Docker if you set it up correctly. You can have Kubernetes. And then you can have Azure as well. But in our case, it's the Portainer agent, which makes it a little bit easier for us. And then they want to know, is it running Linux or Windows? In this case, it's Linux. Um, I don't run Windows machines very much. Is it Kubernetes via load balancer? You know, those kind of things. It's none of those for me. And it says copy if you need it. I don't. So the name, I'm just going to call this iMac hyphen Linux, which it already was before. I'm going to give it the endpoint URL, 192, and there it is right there with the port number 9001. So 9001 is the port number for the Portainer agent. If it's just Portainer, it's 9000 if you're trying to log into the web UI. But if it's the agent running on another machine, then it's port 9001. We're going to put the same thing in the uh, public IP address, even though it's not a public IP, this is how it reaches it. So we want to put that same thing. Now make sure you use your IP address for your machine, but the port is generally 9001 unless you changed it. As far as the group, you can create groups. If you have lots and lots and lots of machines that you're managing Portainer on, then you can create groups and you can then get to those groups. I don't have any created, so it's just unassigned. And then, of course, you can add tags to those machines as well. And then we can say add the agent, I believe. I don't think we need anything else. So I'm going to click on add agent. And when you click on add agent, it'll bring you back to your endpoint uh, add space or remove space. So here you see now I've got my iMac Linux. I've got that it shows agent 
and I've got the information that I put in. Now I can click into here and again I can edit all of that stuff just like you can anywhere else inside of Portainer. But if I go back to home now, you'll see that I've got all three of these set up and I can click into my iMac Linux and you'll see I've got three containers running. So I've got this one called eBay Data Mongo that stopped. I'm not using it right now, that's why it stopped. I've got one called eBay Data that's running. Again, not, not anything I'm using, it's just something I test with. And then finally I've got the Portainer agent that is running currently. So I can manage these things now with Portainer. But what's more interesting is really what I do with the other machines. So if I go to my local here, you can see that I've got quite a few containers running. So I've got 13 running right here. And you can kind of see what I've got going. I've got Nginx Proxy Manager. I've got Matomo where I kind of keep some statistics on my uh, show notes website. Portainer, of course, is running. Here's that eBay data that I was testing with. I moved it over to kind of check it out. And then I've got Apache. I've got Glances. I've got Metabase. I've got DuckDNS running. I've got the other half of that eBay data stuff going. So these two guys kind of go together. I've got Watchtower running, kind of keeping an eye on things to tell me when things are ready for updates. I've got GoDaddy DNS, which I'll do a, a video on that as well. It's very similar to Duck DNS, but it's just for if you have GoDaddy services, basically. I have Nginx Proxy Manager on the database side, and then I have Chow that keeps an eye on all my websites and sends me emails whenever things go down or change status, uh, those kind of things. So these, these are all my containers on this one, but I can manage all of these things from here. And with Watchtower, I have it set to monitor only, so it just tells me when there's updates for these. I can come in and say, you know what, this, this has an update. I'm going to recreate it. So I'm going to go into my Apache. I'm going to say recreate. I'm going to click on this one and I'm just going to click recreate. It's going to take just a second. You'll see that line go across the top while it's working. It's really going to keep all of my data, everything else in place. It goes through and it should give you a nice green sign with a check mark on it. And you should see that it's back up and running inside of the system whenever it's finished. And then I can go out here to check out whether Apache is up and running. And there it is. My Apache is ready for me to log in. And then here's all my music and I'm ready to go. So it's all up to date. Everything looks good on it. I feel good about that. So I can go back to my home and I can say, you know what, let me go out to my Ubuntu server VM. And here I've got 10 containers running. I guess I can make this bigger for you guys. So here I've got ExpressVPN and I'll be doing a video on this uh, in the future on how I'm using this along with some of these uh, other containers but I've got ExpressVPN, Jellyfin, Jacket, Qubit, Torrent, Sonar, Mesh Central, Homer for my dashboarding, Motion iOS which I use to check out my cameras, I've got Watchtower to keep an eye on all of these guys and then of course I've got the Portainer agent which is what lets me get in here and manage these things. So again, it's a really great way to have a nice overview of what you've got going, whether or not they're healthy and running. If they have any kind of health checks, great. If not, it'll tell you whether it's running or stopped. You can check the logs. But one of the cool things is if you need to get into one of these to do something to make a change to like a uh, to make a change to a configuration file, if you don't want to do it on your local system, you can do it right here. You can click on this little thing that looks like a command line. And then right here you can say bin bash or you can pick if it's bin sh, bin bash, you know, whatever you need. So I'm going to leave it on bin bash and then I'm going to click on connect. And if this thing supports bash, it will connect and let you get onto the terminal. Now this one may not support it. Let's try sh. Yeah, so this one supports bin sh. I can do ls and see what's going on inside of the file system. And you can see that now I'm inside of this and I can kind of check out what's happening. I can just click exit and it gets me out. It disconnects me or I can click on disconnect to also disconnect me as well. Now it says you can use custom commands if you want to. So if I click that, I can put in here whatever I want. I can type in a command. I can hit connect. It's going to try to run that command inside of the inside of the, the terminal, but then it'll be finished. Um, so it's kind of cool that you can do that thing, but they give you some preset options. You can always go with a custom command if you need to. So this is really a, a great system. I, I love the way that it functions. I love the power that it gives you. And they've really thought through how all of this should work. Um, I just can't say enough about Portainer, how much I like it and how much how great I think it is. If you guys have not seen my previous Portainer videos, um, I did it quite a while ago. And I was still pretty fresh to Docker and everything. And even then I thought it was great. But it's gotten better over time by, by a lot. And I've learned a lot more about it. 
Um, just want to show you how to install it, how to set up the agent, because I did do a video a long time ago about how to connect another portainer to, to the current portainer you're running. It was a whole lot of steps, and now they've got this portainer agent that's much easier, and maybe they even had it then, and I just didn't realize they had it, but this makes it much easier to set up multiple portainers and kind of control them from one place, which I think is just absolutely great. If you enjoyed this video, like, subscribe, tell your friends about it so they can come along on the journey with us, and I'll talk to you next time. Oh, <laughs>